Good evening and welcome to another AOS webinar. Uh, tonight we're delighted to be joined by uh, John Edwards um, with his a lecture titled Wilderness Trekking in Oman, a 200-kilometre uh, traverse of the uh, Western Hajar Mountains. Uh, so by way of an introduction, John spent uh, 16 years working out in the Sultanate and he spent a great or oh, good deal of his uh, winter weekends uh, discovering and mapping long-distance hiking trails throughout the Hajar Mountains. Uh, his ambition is to, is to resurrect the historic uh, trading routes connecting mountain villages uh, to help sustain an emerging hospitality industry. He created the first non-military contour map of the region for local walkers, and he's recently published a book, Wilderness Trekking in Oman, which was featured in the 2020 Annual Review. He also runs a website, www.hajarhiking.com, which I'd encourage you all to check out. Um, so in terms of the format of uh, this lecture, where John will speak for about 30 minutes uh, with a slideshow, uh, we'll then go straight into a, a 15 minute Q&A. So please drop your questions into the, uh, the Q&A function, which you should see at the, the bottom of your screens. So I'll pass you over to John now. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for, for, uh, for joining. I'll do a presentation first. Um, let me share my screen. Wilderness Trekking Oman, 200 kilometer traverse of the Western Hajar Mountains. So first I'd like to um, give thanks to my family who joined me in the many winter weekends over the 16 years I spent working in Oman. So these are my two of my three children, Jennifer and Benjamin. Um, Benjamin's about eight in this picture. So we're looking at, we're 2,000 meters high um, above Sia, which is about 40 minutes drive from Muscat on the way to, on the way to Kuriat. So my children joined me on many of these trips and I'm very grateful that they did. And here's my wife. Um, she also joined me on many trips. Here she is having a sleep in on the needles of a juniper tree. And I'll also like to give thanks to uh, uh, British um, loan service soldiers who whom I met in 91 on my first trip to Oman, on the first assignment there when I spent there four years. Um, and these gentlemen could speak about 100 words of Arabic or 200. That was part of the, their requirement for training. <laughs> so that was Barry on, the, um, Barry on the right and Bill on the left. Bill actually lived on Jebel Akhtar. And they um, introduced me to the mountains at the time when it was a, a closed area. And I'm very grateful that they did. I'd also like to give thanks to my Amani uh, companions who've helped me um, make this book and uh, been very, very enthusiastic supporters of my whole project. So what we're looking at here is, is the trip. We, we, it starts off um, on, on, on the left, on, on the highway from Muscat to Nizwa, a, a little town called Alafia, which is about one hour's drive. You can get there by Beza bus or, or taxi. And it finishes at Yika, which is about one and a half hours drive from Muscat, not far from Rustak. So the journey basically follows the ridge of the spine of the Western Hajar Mountains. You can see from the contour map on the right, it's actually a lot more um, vertical ascents and descents than indicated by that um, rather gentle blue line on the, on, on the uh, Google Earth image. So the reason for, for all of those climbs is because what the village, what the track is doing is following from village to village and the villages themselves are located by springs. And these springs are about a kilometer thick um, Maozic limestone, which is sitting on a um, unconformable surface, a very, very hard rock. And this kilometer thick limestone soaks up the winter rain over, over hundreds of years. And that gives a um, spring flow throughout the year, well, in fact, for decades. Um, between major rains. So what this gives is a, a, a string of cements which the tracks, the track is connecting. So the villages themselves are connected by roads from the um, desert plains below, but there are tracks above leading to the plateau where the villagers used to go up and take their goats. There's also a large number of um, tracks linking the villages on the foothills to on the villages on the ridge where people used to trade because the villages on the high altitudes were growing different kind of crops, for example, pomegranates, 
while the lower villages are growing date. So there's, there's trading routes and also goat tracks. So the track, the, the 200 kilometer um, traverse I put together is a combination of these two kinds of walks. So th this is a one side, a two sided map I put together for this, for the book. So you can buy the book or the map. And the, the map itself was a, a major adventure dealing with um, the Oman Survey Authority, part of the Ministry of Defense. So it's actually the first contour map they've allowed to be published um, for, for the public. Up until now, if you wanted to have a contour map of the mountains, you had to, or anywhere in Oman, really, you had to get hold of a, a military map, which, which are not public. So the expats used to pass around copies of military maps. Now, the reason... They were reluctant initially to allow this to happen, and no one's done it before, is because of three things. There's, there's a certain sensitivity about maps in Oman, in fact, everywhere in the world now, because of the issue of people using maps of international boundaries to try and postulate where, where, country, where, where country begins and another one ends. And in this particular case, um, Oman was a little bit worried about maps missing out Musandam. So my map had many international boundaries, so that wasn't an issue, but it was the background reason for no private contour maps. The second issue was that the map is of a sensitive area. For about 100 years, up until the 1950s, the mountains were effectively as run as a separate country from the coast, and there have been a number of rebellions. The biggest one, of course, was the 57-59 Jalakta War. But there's, there's even been some... Uh, disturbances since then, and so it's a sensitive area. So they eventually agreed. Uh, I just had to be patient, and they could see why I wanted to have a map. The reason, my reason being, of course, that I wanted to create a kind of tourism between these villages, which would help the villagers maintain their villages and create a, a different kind of hospitality industry than the five star today. And they thought that was a good idea. So they agreed, and then there was a real saga about. The, Arab, the Romanized spelling of Arabic, and that took a, basically two years to, to sort it out. What they're trying to do is standardize the spelling so that you do not get, and any expatriate, and I'm, I'm living in Oman or even a tourist will notice, you don't get the same village name spelt differently on different signs, different maps, different books. They're trying to standardize. And, and it's very complicated because every ministry has got their own understanding of how to spell, and even the municipality have got even different ideas how to spell the same name. And so the Oman Survey Authority are trying to correct that. And so from now on, everything they authorize has to have uh, a spelling according to their list. For example, Wukan, which is I noticed in, in the um, Anglo Money Society magazine, is actually W U K A N. So perhaps the editor of that magazine could have a look at this spelling list as well. Now, the, the other issue, of course, was a large number of names on my map and not even uh, written down anywhere because we're talking about names of cave drips, springs, sp small, tiny hamlets um, where people would, would just camp. And these names have never been written down before. So the idea was that because they were going to be printed on a map, you know, both myself and the Oman Survey Authority wanted to get it right. So that meant booking telephone calls by mobile to the map people in the village so they could recount to the gentleman in Muscat what they thought they sh the name should be, and then the Oman Survey Authority would give me a, a spelling. So back to the map itself, it's one of the thousand. The red line is, the, is one half of the 200-kilometer um, contour, and all the gray lines are side tracks. It's about 400 kilometers of side track described um, in the book and, and, and on the map as well. And that's the second half of, of the trip. And there's a, there's a choice here here between a high route and a low route. The high route involves a little bit more climbing than the low route, but you don't need ropes for any of the trip. So my ambition with this book and map and the whole, whole endeavor really is, is, is to encourage um, tourists, walking tourists, to, to, to walk between these villages and, and provide a, a clientele for, a, for a, an evolving industry of, of, of converting these um, village houses into bed and breakfast. So this is not a new idea at all in, in, in the world. For example, the UK has got fantastic tracks where you can walk from village to village and stay in old houses. But in, in Oman, this hasn't really happened yet. In fact, the first attempt at doing this, it took the gentleman in, in um, 
missed it out of Breen seven years to get permission because, of course, some people in the village are still living there were a little bit concerned about the idea. But now it's been ex accepted. Now, that particular vi village was still inhabited, but there are many villages which are being abandoned. And this is one way of observing the, that culture, that, that, that fantastic village, because the, the roofs of these houses, once they collapse, when people have left, it, it doesn't take long, you know, 20, 30 years before the house is destroyed. And yet the villages themselves have been there literally for over a thousand years. So this idea of preserving these villages and making a bed and breakfast business out of it does two things. It preserves a culture. It also keeps at least some people in the mountains. So this is one example of an existing um, bed and breakfast. This is uh, at El Sarja, the hotel's called The Cliff. It's got six rooms at the moment. And, and it's quite a tedious to get there by a vehicle, by a four-wheel drive. You're talking about a two-and-a-half, three-hour journey. And there's not much to do there apart from walk. But walking in, having a hot shower, they'll provide a village meal for you, and then walking out the next day. It's, it's a perfect use for the hotel. That, that's an example of a village which has been abandoned um, some time ago, Maserat Ashokwan Ne'arus. And th this, again, will be a perfect place because you can see these houses still in good condition to, for someone to go back and convert some of these buildings into, into, into a bed and breakfast for travellers. This is inside one of those houses. So now I'd like to talk about the different kind of tracks on, that you encounter on, on, on this 200 kilometer walk. There's horse tracks, donkey tracks, unladen donkey tracks, and man tracks. So this is an example of a horse track. This, this, this is um, the top of Wadi Bani Karus. The, the horse tracks have been used apparently for 300 years. And at that time, Oman had a horse export industry. They were selling horses to India. And the reason for the, for the extra work to build such an elaborate staircase, and there's many of these on the particular route, is that with this kind of capital investment, with this amount of civil engineering, the horses could be used and they would go much faster than donkeys. So this is a donkey track. On the, on the right, you can see that small aperture. This is for goats to go back and forth, um, whereas the donkey itself is a gate. And, and uh, Abdullah here is just basically assembling and reassembling the gate. So the idea of these, this particular gate is, is the donkeys, are, when they're not used, they're normally released into, into a wadi area, which is um, encompassed by cliffs all around, and to, and to stop the donkeys from going too far, any place where they can walk out is, is trapped with, with a gate such as this. And this is an example of an unladen donkey track, where you can see that if the donkey had a load on its back, it would be wedged into that rock. So, so these tracks, um, are used when the, when the donkey caravans are returning as a shortcut. It, 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 looks, it, it looks a bit difficult, and it actually is. I mean, when I took my wife up there, she's on her, on her hands and knees to go up, up, up that narrow um, track. And finally, we've got man tracks. Now, this is not the main route. This is one of the side tracks, but this is, this is typical of a kind of a man track. Obviously, a donkey's not going to go here. And there, there are a large number of... Well, their man tracks. I mean, just for, for people between the villages, because the, the, the villages are linked by trading routes when they're at different altitude, when they've got something to trade between them. But villages at the same altitude, there's no trading because they're all growing the same material. So the tracks themselves are, are just for people. And, and it's, so then sometimes more difficult, as you can see in this example. This is a even more severe man track. This is a track leading up to... Um, a foulage, and, and this is a, a maintenance for that foulage. And this is a, this is a, as, as hairy as it looks. Um, you don't need a rope to go on this track. It's a side track. There's nothing on the main route as difficult as this. You just need a head for heights. So now I'd like to talk about water on the trip. There's different sources of water. There's springs. I've already discussed that. The whole reason for the population on the mountains is because of the the, the, the line of springs that are around 1,500 metres. There's plastic tanks being put there by the government, open reservoirs that need boiling, and the village village and, and finally the hotels. So this is an example of, a, of just a drip, really. There's, there's enough water coming out here to, to fill up that platypus, that plastic bottle that Abdullah's filling at the moment. These are all um, marked with the GPS coordinates on the map. The, you can get the coordinates off my website. And, and, and they've all been given names, as I described earlier, 
um, with the Oman Soviet authorities sort of blessing the spelling that we came up with um, for each of these locations. This is an example of a plastic tank. The government would put these in by helicopter at the request um, of the, of the Shawi people. The Shawi people would actually pay for this tank, but they would not pay to put it up there. They'd buy it um, and then tell the military you know, in Rasta, for example, that the tank was there and, and, and then whenever the military had, a, had an opportunity to do a lift, they would put it where the Shawi people would like, like it to put. So you, there's, there's a tap you can see on the lower left-hand side where, where the tap is actually disconnected from the, from the valve itself just to make sure an inquisitive goat doesn't nibble it and turn the tap on and get. So this tank is filled with rainwater, not normally just um, by, by donkey, they'll just fill up um, from, from a, a local dam after rain and they'll just go back and forth manually filling up the tank and then, and then that will be there near, near where they live um, if, if, if the particular campsite doesn't have a spring. So this is their water, but travelers are allowed to use it, obviously not to wash, but it's fine to, to, to use this water to drink. And finally, there's, a, there's an open dam that's in, in, in front of this house. The, this open dam um, has got water, which is not completely clean. You can see it's fenced to avoid the goats um, making a mess of it. But this water, unlike the other two, does need boiling before you use it. So there's none of the campsites on the 16th. They walk, you have to use this kind of water. But they're all marked as emergency supplies. The, the, the water on the trip itself is all um, spring water, hotel water. So now I'd like to talk about the climate. The walking season in Oman is, is in winter, the four months, November through to February. You, you can walk a bit on the shoulder, but those four months, the weather's actually fantastic. Typically, you're talking about 15, 12 degree daytime, and at nighttime, it can freeze. So it also can rain. Now, the, the weather in summer is unstable because the mountains are on the fringe of the monsoon, but in winter, the weather forecasts are very reliable. So you can get good indication it's going to rain, but, but it does rain, probably once a month or so. So here's one example of a, of a fantastic, fantastic waterfall. They show up all over the place whenever you uh, get a rain. You just have to make sure you're not camped underneath it. This is um, an example of a, a storm. It's only lasted half an hour in Wadi Knuckle. If you listen to the thunder, Yeah, we got completely soaked. Um, it also does snow, not, not off, probably every two or three years. Um, and again, you just have to have the right gear for that. Here's uh, Mohamed Azri and El Said enjoying uh, playing and taking pictures of the snow on, on near Jebel Shams. So now I'd like to talk about the people you meet up there. The, the, it's interesting for the Shawi people. They're, they're basically semi-nomadic pastoralists. They traditionally live, move between three, four, five, or six of, of what basically campsites, moving their goats. They, they would move between these campsites for their own um, comfort, basically. They would try and avoid the heat when they could in summer and avoid the mosquitoes um, and, and avoid the cold in winter. And, of course, their goats would benefit from these moves as well. Now, these people, uh, here they're having a uh, their lunch. Their, their lifestyle is... is, is has survived remarkably well. So now one of their six campsites is now a modern house. So they have internet connection, mobiles, TV, everything in their modern house. But they still have their, their half dozen or so campsites in the interior, you know, not normally within half a day's walk between each. And, and some of the people in, in their home will have a modern job and some will carry on their traditional work, basically living off uh, a goat herd of, 50 or, or, or 100 goats, typically around 50 goats and a few sheep. And these are the people that know the tracks most of all. By tradition, they will be the ones that will be running the donkey caravans between the villages, the villages being the people that would be um, cultivating the terraces. And so these are the people that, who typically you find will offer guide services and will know the tracks rather than the people who um, uh, are living in the thick settlements, for um, example, at Wukan, where they have terraces and, and, and don't move between the villages to the same extent as these people do. This is an example of one of the campsites. You can see they've got um, dried goat meat 
hanging up and, and you can see the goat skins full of water that, that's slowly oozing out the water, which, which makes it cool. Um, and and it, it, it tastes absolutely fine. This is a, a showery hut. They, they, to, they don't normally sleep in these unless the weather is very bad. So you sleep outside. These, these are actually storehouses. And again, in the foreground, you can see a goat skin that's been used for, for carrying uh, water. And traditionally, it used to be cooked, carried, um, used for carrying milk or even wine. Here's the showery boys bringing me uh, hot water to make a cup of tea. And this is um, a gentleman making coffee. We start right from the beans, cook the beans, grind it up. And uh, so it's quite a process and it tastes fantastic. And the Shawi people are all also keeping up with the crafts. I mean, this particular um, Shawi family are living right by the main road. So, so some of them have a, a modern lifestyle and other, others are still keeping up traditions, for example, making the rugs. The, the, the boys on the, on the upper right are looking at a um, sort of a mock-up of this book and uh, amused to see pictures of, of, of some of their relatives featured because the, they were my guides and I've got their photographs in various pages. So the sites you're going to see um, on, the, on the trip, this is some examples. This is in Wadi Halfain, this is a very interesting um, foliage which is so thick, so wide, it also doubles up as a donkey track. So, so the, that, it's not used anymore as a donkey track, but that was capped with stones, flat stones. So underneath the, 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 the path, there was flowing water for the foliage and the, go, the, and the donkey caravan the top and that that's another example from what health fame you can see in the lower um bottom of the center of the picture you can see these bright terraces now sometimes you see these terraces and you think oh what a shame they're they're abandoned but in fact not all the terraces are cultivated all the time some of the terraces beneath the ones that are irrigated with the springs uh, are, are not irrigated, they're only planted after the rain. Because as I said, it rains every couple of months typically. So to be, after 24 hours after that rain, everyone will run outside and basically repair the terraces and get a quick crop planted. And that, and that will complement the crops planted on, on the terraces which are irrigated. So the, the, the idea is that you make the most of all the rainfall. And there's an example of an irrigated terrace that, that, that's in Maserat al Jawad. This is a, a wolf trap. This is on the, uh, on the first day, actually, coming up from Alafia on the way to um, Hadesh. Now, the, these wolf traps are no longer used because there's no more wolves in, in um, Western Hajar. They still exist in Eastern Hajar. The, the, the reason the uh, Omanis basically killed off the wolf just in this small local mountain range is because they were bothering their sheep and uh, the goats. And, and the reason for, um, for doing that, of course, is that meant they didn't have to have a shepherd all the time and, and, and the efficiency gained with that means it is possible and a lot of people do in fact have, have a, a five day a week job in the local town and, and, and they'll still have a goat herd they only have to visit the goats two or three times in the week whereas when, when the wolves exist as they do in Eastern Hajar that's not possible so this efficiency related to the demise of the wolf is in fact a, a, a small scale a duplicate of what happened in England in the medieval time when in the 12th century um, all the wolves were killed off and, and, and the um, sheep herds in, in, in England went from 50 to several hundred and that meant that efficiency meant that England could dominate the Europe's wool trade so in, in Oman it's not quite that it's scale but the, the, the demise of the wolf even though it's a shame um, has had a, a recent level of efficiency so this is a cave village. This is one of the campsites, not used anymore. It's rather remarkable because the entire village is all underneath the overhang. And this is something completely different. It's a Bronze Age tomb. So, um, in, the, in the Bronze Age, it was about a period of 200 years based on the, on the geological record where the mountains were a lot moister than they've ever been before or since. And that led to a population explosion. And, and um, well, not really an explosion, but a higher population density than, than today. And as a, as a result of that, there's a large number of these Bronze Age tombs all over the mountains, there's literally hundreds of them. And the vast majority haven't been excavated. There's even 
more more fabulous ones in Bart, for instance, which are UNESCO's site. But in fact, uh, you can go in the mountains and find them all by yourself, and and there's nothing there. It's just just but, but, but overlooking um, on prominent prominent places where where where, where you can see the spot has, has got some sort of mystic significance. Normally, in the, in the center of a big plain or on a ridge overlooking a wadi, they're, they're all they all look like monuments. And and uh, if, when you first see them, you think, well, these these are done by the Amanis as, as a kind of marker for a track, but they're not. They're just they're just random, and and they are literally Bronze Age remnants. So now I'd like to talk about the Persian Steppe myth. It's a different subject, not really anything to do with. The walk itself, but it's a, one of the issues I've dealt with in the history chapter of the book. So what happened was that it, the, the second second British explorer to visit the mountains, S.B. Cole, in 1876, he was the um, he waited seven years in Muscat before there was an opportunity, a safe opportunity for him to go to the mountains because the, 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 there was a aftermath of a civil war. Um, between various tribe, two tribe confederations, and he had to go in summer at night because it was so dangerous. And when he went there, um, he, he he saw these fabulous steps and and thought that it couldn't have possibly been the feuding Arabs to do that level of civil engineering. So he saw he decided they must be Persian, and that's what he said. So I, I've got some. Anecdotal evidence that, that suggests that's not the case. So I'm going to show you now uh, some video clips I took of Oman and of Yemen at exactly the same time in same year, '92. This is um, this is Bilat Sait. So what I want, what I want to look at is the the houses above the terraces, and then you've got the flat terraces, the gates. And the style of houses with, with the small windows. And then I'll show you another, another village. This, this, this is um, Wadi Bunny Habib. Again, these, these are videos taken in 92. This village has just been abandoned when I got there. I mean, a few years before, everyone left, and, and there's only a few families left. But notice the style of the window. So the reason I'm drawing your attention to this is because after this clip, I'm going to show you some videos from Yemen taken in the same year. Now, in Yemen, there's no evidence of, of Persian influence. Unlike Oman, the Persians did invade the mountains once uh, in the 10th century. And that's another reason the British labeled the, the steppes Persian. But in Yemen, there's no evidence of, of any Persian influence. And yet you see exactly the same style of, of life, of, of mountain paths, crisscrossing the mountains, of donkey tracks like this, of massive terraces. The rainfall in Yemen is a lot more than Oman, um, and probably about an order of magnitude more rain, so the population density is again about 10 times more. The, 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 these videos were taken on a two one week walk I did about a hundred kilometers northwest of Sana. So I'm not exactly sure where it was precisely because I didn't have a map. I just did it off of uh, hearsay. But the area is very close to where the Beni Riam uh, believe they came from when they left Yemen to Oman. Now the Beni Riam did that. It's all, it's all a Sort of a fable, but there's there's um, a lot of historical evidence to suggest that they really made that migration. And the reason for the migration was that the, the Yemenis were cultivating with a, with a flood, um, a, a, a style of irrigation that involved making dams and storing the water from flood diversion, rather than using spring system. And the, these flood diversion systems would every so often collapsed because of an extra heavy rain. So the biggest one was the Murrah Dam, which collapsed seven times over 700 years. And each time it collapsed, it took generations of people to rebuild it. And during that time, they had a famine because prior to the collapse, these dams were, were uh, irrigating hundreds of kilometers. 
So every time there was a major storm, a hundred year event, there was a wave of immigration, not one as the fable says, but actually seven from Yemen throughout the Middle East. And it's one of those migrations, we're talking about starting in the second century, up, up, up to the seventh century, that the um, Bani Riyam left this area and moved to Jebel Akta. And from this area, you can see that the style of architecture, the style of windows in that building under the overhang, it, it, what they did in Jebel Akta is, is reproduce their, their lifestyle, their architecture, their, their, everything they did in Yemen, they redid it again in Oman. So there's no reason to give Persians any credit for, for those paths that you saw earlier in my presentation. The Persian step was just a, a mistake, an interpretation by a British explorer, and unfortunately it stuck. Even, even the Amanis call them Persian step, which is a real shame because it's not Persian, it's their own, it's their own architecture, it's their own civil engineering. I hope these villages look the same now as they did when I took these pictures. So thank you for listening to my talk. Um, yeah, that was half an hour. So now I'd like to uh, answer any questions. So John, thanks so much for that. Um, I'll just uh, collect some of the questions from the Q&A. Um, the first question I've got for you is, um, are there any similar initiatives across the Middle East, uh, particularly in the, in the GCC, uh, that Iman could potentially emulate or look to learn from? Um, the only one I know of is in Jordan. There's a, there is a long distance walk in Jordan um, that, that, that sort of terminates in, in Wadi Rum. I don't know of any other, any, any, anything in the GCC countries. And, and of course, it's a kind of a new idea because up until now, the, the emphasis of the tourism departments of, of most of the countries have been five star. You know, they're, they're trying to get a different kind of tourist who can, spends a lot of money in shops and things and stays in the five star hotel and doesn't really go, doesn't really leave the hotel. So the, the kind of people that would do this walk and, and not going to spend a lot of time in shopping, they're, they're basically going to show up with all of their camping gear and, and, and just walk. Um, and so it's not, it wasn't the first target clientele for tourism, but, I, but you can see from the example I gave, or you gave, that in, in UK, for instance, the Southwest Coastal Park generates percent of the tourism revenue for, for, for um, uh, those, those provinces, Dorset, Somerset, Cornwall, and Cornwall. So um, it, it can make a significant, well, not, I mean, not, not a major impact, but a, an impact. And, and that 5% comes from a, a European Union analysis of, of what happens to some of the money they spent on, on maintaining that track. And afterwards, they wanted to find out what, what good did it do. And, and, and the return on that investment was, was fantastic. So there's no reason why Oman can't do the same thing, particularly in the winter months, because the weather is incredible. Fantastic. And, and another question is, um, how much have you seen the area uh, change uh, since you first went there? And particularly, have you noticed that a, a lot of young people have left uh, the communities in the mountains to, to seek um, lifestyle or, or better employment prospects in, in the cities? No, oh dear. Your internet connection. One of us has got a bad connection. I s sorry, Nick, I didn't get the question. Sorry, John, I'll say it again. Uh, it was a question about, have you seen a lot of changes since you, uh, you first started uh, hiking in the region? And particularly, have you seen a lot of young people leave uh, to seek employment in the cities? Uh, and absolutely, that's the problem. And it's not just so mine, it's all over the world. I mean, it, you know, it, everywhere, these very um, remote rural communities are, are, are losing population. I mean, the same thing's happening you know, in New Zealand, where I'm from. So, yes, and, and the other problem, of course, is that when the government puts a road in, it, it, it's sometimes very expensive to get the road all the way to the existing village. And so they will get within a kilometre or two, um, and then there may be one, or, one more wadi to cross, and it's just far too expensive. So, so without really realising the significance of what they've done, 
will tell the villagers, well, this is the best we can do. And then the villagers will just move a kilometre. But that means that they have effectively abandoned their old village and start all over again with, with, with the modern village. And that, that's, that's one of the problems, is, is, is that these villages that are abandoned, um, you know, if, if, if they're not put to some use, you have to maintain it for a reason. And the hospitality industry is one way of, of, of making sense of, of, of this wonderful architecture. Now, the other, other issue, of course, is a lot of villages on the mountain have, have a twin village. Now, again, the reason for that was because they had to have one village for summer and one for winter, um, typically only half a day's walk between. But, but the whole agricultural reason for that twin village is gone. So one of those two villages, again, being abandoned. Yeah, we've got a logistical and an administrative question now for you. Um, if you were to find yourself in, uh, in need of extraction on one of these walks, how would you go about it? And secondly, uh, what would you be looking at for a mean budget for a, for a two-week hiking trip? Okay, well, the, the safety question, that is addressed quite well in the book. I mean, basically what you need to do is, is, is take a, um, have two... Um, SIM cards for the two different mobile companies and um, there's two companies that between the two of them cover the whole mountain range and, and that with, and have a cheap typical, uh, typical Nokia type phone which you can buy in Oman where it, it, the battery will last you for a week as long as you use it just for text and that phone you keep it for emergencies with the two SIM cards so that you know you can make a quick call and, and, they, and then you have a GPS but you have to have anyone to do the walk. So if you have an accident, get your coordinates, make a call, and, and, and they will come and get you. So at the moment, there is no charge for the service, um, and, and, but the authorities have said that the, in the future, if it's used too much, then, then perhaps they will come up with some way of um, charging for it. But at the moment, it's free, but they do encourage everyone to take out insurance. So as for budget, I mean, it's very cheap. I mean, the main thing really is, is, is your flights and the, and the hotel are the beginning and end. When, you, when you're staying in the mall, in the interior, you're basically going to be eating dehydrated food, which you've posted yourself from your, your home to the various hotels. So that as you walk, you're typically carrying three or four days food. You arrive at one of the hotels and you pick up the next three or four days food. So it's actually a cheap holiday. Okay, that, uh, that actually answers what the other question I was going to ask you, which is, um, do you have to take all the food yourself? But it definitely appears you do. Um, so I've also been asked another question, John, which is, um, uh, what do you think the, the, the government can do to invest and develop the region? Um, well, I think the first thing the government can do, actually, just to market this style of tourism, because the government marketing is basically have been around the five-star hotels. That, 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 that's been their emphasis, and, and they haven't really looked at this kind of thing at all. In fact, the first, in fact, as far as I know, all of the existing, and it's not many, village hotels, the ones I've just shown you described in, in um, Mr. Alabrin, uh, uh, have a lot of issues getting a license to even operate because it's so unusual. Because up, up until now, that hasn't been the style of... of, of hospitality in the country. So, so what the government could do is, is, is just make it easier for people to even open these hotels. I mean, it's not a matter of money because it doesn't cost much for them to do it. I mean, every, all the materials they're using are local materials. It's just giving them um, encouragement and, and giving them a license to do it. And then ultimately marketing the whole thing. Because as you know, in the, in the UK, you know, you know, the, the councils will get together you know, between, for example, Dorset, Devon, Somerset, and Cornwall, and, 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 and jointly market the Southwest Coastal Trail. So that they're not actually spending much money, but they're just making sure everyone knows that it exists. And, and, and if you want to, you can walk the entire coastline, um, you know, if going from bed and breakfast to bed and breakfast. So I, I just want the same thing to happen in the, in, in, in the mountains. And then another logistical question, John. Um, do the local community act as guides, and uh, how do you reach them and make contact with them? Right, there's two, there's two kinds of, well, three kinds of people really up in the mountains. 
Amanis, I mean, Jawi people are the ones that know the tracks very well, and they are the ones that you should ask directions. Now, the kind of people in the villages that live, for example, in Wukan, that don't traditionally haven't actually walked the tracks at all. They, they, they lived in, in one house, or sometimes two if it's a split village, winter and summer. Entire livelihood traditionally has been based around, around the irrigated terraces. Now, they have goats as well, but they're primarily, they're primarily what they call farmers, and they don't know the tracks. And the third kind of people that you do find now, for example, in Jebelakta, is just city people that decide to, you know, telecommute, you know, basically work in the mountains or work one week on, one week off. So they don't know the mountains either. It's only the Shawi people that really know these tracks. So how to contact them, um, that, that is not straightforward, unfortunately. I mean, that, that's another thing the government could do is, 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 is facilitate the communication between these people who could offer their services and... Um, and, and tourists. So the book I've written, it, it's really possible to do it yourself. It's, it's not intended to have a guide. It's, it's a self-guide um, descriptions and a map. But of course, it would be a lot easier if you did have a guide and it would create employment. But, but that is not, it's a bit, you know, what comes first. At, at, at the moment, there's no, not enough people doing this to justify guided industry and, and, and therefore started. Hopefully it will start in future because those people don't know the tracks, but they only know 30 kilometers max. They, 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 they know the area where they have their half a dozen um, campsites. So there's no one who knows the whole trip in, in Oman, except my friends, Omani friends who have helped me put it together. Thanks, John. And um, I've got a question here about uh, your views on the impact of, of growth in tourism in Oman on both the traditional lifestyle, but more importantly, the natural landscape. So a recent example is a staircase built by the no local municipality in the Miban village of Tiwi, where some concrete stairs are built leading all the way to the waterfall, changing the landscape forever. And there's also constant talk about making a gondola, a gondola lift to Masha Sal Jin. Do you have any reflections on that? Well, I mean, I don't like that kind of thing at all. It spoils, it's, it, you don't need to, to put a concrete staircase. Now, I, I have put some chain ladders up, two of them, to, to facilitate the high route um, because I wanted to make sure that you didn't need a rope to do this. But that is a basically almost touch it to see it's there. It, it's not a concrete um, staircase. I, I, I think that's probably a shame. I can see why in a few places, just to make it, completely easy because it, 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 you still have to have a head for heights but that that's not the kind of tourist and tourism industry which i'm proposing and encouraging in this book at all and um i've got another question here again um for aspiring hikers uh what what grasp of arabic do you need if any at all um well you, you probably don't need any at all unfortunately because it, it, one can speak a little bit of English now. I mean, I mean and when the mobile telephone translate, but it, most of the people you meet up there, um, even, even if they're living in the mountains all their life, they, they, they can speak a little bit of English. But on the other hand, it's good to have some Arabic. So I've, 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 in, the, in the book, I've listed, you know, the 50 odd words that, that you should have. And, and it just makes the people smile or laugh and, and, and feel happy that you've made that effort. But you, it's, it's not essential. I think we've got time for just one more question, John. And uh, this one's about um, given that the government um, uh, funding may, may struggle over the next year or so, um, how can the private, private sector look to promote and invest in this? And uh, another offshoot of this question is um, do you think there's opportunities for collaboration between some of the five star hotels and um, the smaller lodges and guest houses which you talk about? Well, I question first. I try desperately to get some of the five star hotels involved in this because um, there are there are two five star hotels which could be used as a place to stop uh, on on the sixteen day walk, but but for some reason, you know, they just didn't didn't get it. I, I mean, the, the whole concept of, of of a five star hotel sharing a marketing brochure with 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 a, a, a village bed and breakfast, they just didn't. They thought they were so different, they didn't imagine anyone would stay in both. 
and, and they weren't interested. And, and when I proposed that they could even set up a camp near the hotel so people come and get water, hot shower, go to their restaurant, but they would prefer to camp outside because they're not going to spend 200 reals. I mean, that will probably be the budget for the whole trip in one night. None of the five-star hotels expressed any interest at all, which is a real shame. I mean, I, I don't think they understood the process because most of their guests just show up, stay in the hotel and go away again. They don't, they don't venture very far at all. So the whole idea of someone coming in, staying one night, you know, walking in, um, it just, just seemed outside their imagination. Um, John, thanks so much uh, for joining us today. Sorry? So, uh, yeah. Sorry, John. There was two questions. I asked the second one. Uh, yeah, so the second was on, uh, it was on the, um, you answered both that part. It was on the, what can a private sector do in collaboration between five-star hotels and, and the smaller lodges? Well, I... Just time will tell because I, I, I think as more people start making these kinds of trips, the, the five, I mean, it's just business, right? The five-star hotels will see, well, this is an opportunity. I mean, I mean, uh, you know, if, if, if they have a couple of empty rooms, you know, why not let, let people use the bathroom, have a shower for, for, for a quarter of the room rate, and then you can maybe get, get multiple users in one day. I mean, it, it's just a new idea for them at the moment. But in terms of investment, I mean, the, the actual village hotels, the bed and breakfast that are suggesting that they don't actually need money because it doesn't cost them very much. I mean, I mean, the meals they provide are their home cooked food anyway. They're, 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 they're building natural material. All they really need are clients, people to do this. That, that, that's what they need. They need money. They need, they need business. And, and once it starts, it will snowball because a lot of these Omani families, even the ones that live in the cities now, they, they have a, you know, you know, they have a strong connection to, to the village and they would love to have an opportunity themselves to to to, to, to make their own investment and, and to go back and, and 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 to make their old homestead prosper so so the, it isn't a money issue it's a cultural issue we need we need people to do this because it's it's just not, at the moment it's just not done there's, there's up until now there's only really one couple that actually made this walk apart from myself and my companions and my family and they haven't done the whole thing either <laughs> Um, John, I think that's, uh, that's all we've got time for tonight. And thank you so much for such an engaging and informative presentation. Um, for any questions that we haven't answered, um, if you could please feel free to, to email me those and I will, I will pass them on to, to John for comment. Um, but John, thanks again for joining us. And uh, I'm sure you've uh, kicked off a lot of, a lot of wanderlust in our, in our audience tonight. So when, uh, when a circumstances permit and, uh, and flights reopen to Oman, um, I'm sure we'll see a lot more intrepid hikers hitting those trails. Excellent. Thank you Thanks very so much, John. Thanks for inviting me, Nick. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.